The House of Representatives has condemned extrajudicial killings and human rights abuse by security operatives in the enforcement of lockdown order by President Mohamed Buhari and state governors. Moving the motion, Onye George has said security operatives had, according to the National Human Rights Commission, extrajudicial killed 18 innocent Nigerians in Abia, Delta, and Boni, Kaduna, Katsina, and Niger states. Joining us to discuss this is Shegun Awosanya, convener and SAS, and also Shino Fagbenro Bryan, legal practitioner via Skype. Thank you, gentlemen of the press, for joining us tonight. Thank you very much for having us. All right, in April 2020, Nigeria's National Human Rights Commission claimed security operatives killed 18 civilians during the enforcement of the 14 day coronavirus lockdown in various cities. What does it say about our security architecture? I'm going to start with you, Segalink. Yes. I, I, I believe that um, there is so much to be done already um, based on the things that we've been discussing with government. And over the years, over three years now, with the reformation of the entire police system in order for it to be operationally independent and also for there to be a security of tenure, of IG, of the IG. Now, the reason why I brought that up is because Africa already, Nigeria has the largest, you know, uh, silos when it comes to the Nigerian police institution in Africa with 21 MDAs, you know, uh, in the security uh, system itself, whereby you have a lot of things going on in different places without harmonization. So with this, the police have been left to run amok. And also, legislatively, we have a law, the Police Act is still reading 1943 as it's against the 2020 year that we're in. And we have been talking about the police reform bill for ages, for many years now. And even with the one that is still with the House of Rep now, we're still having difficulty in going forward with it. We thank, we thank God that um, we have been able to get the, the police trust fund law passed, but that was also set back also with the appointment of, uh, uh, of, of, of executors of this, of this bill, you know, by people who are not even qualified to be there. A retired IG and then a, 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 a known politician who is I in 2023. So how will the police even believe, trust or believe in an untrusted composition of such a police trust fund? So there are so many things to, to be looked at here. And we're still getting things wrong, thinking that the solution to our to police brutality and the lack of focus of our police institution to what the, the real essence of policing is in the 21st century, you know, is by thinking that there's a state police is going to solve our problem, which is not the case. The police already is decentralized. The, what we should be looking at is a police that is intelligently driven, that is run intelligently, that runs on intelligence, not a police system that runs on brutes, that runs on human rights abuses, and that runs on impunity, which is a culture on its own. Now, Shino, if this is true and anything to go by, what do you think could be the cause of these killings and, and human rights abuses recorded? Okay. Um, in the first place, I, I, I likely... I would want to um, disagree slightly with my, my brother, Shegun. Go ahead. Uh, I think the police is highly central. The training of the police, the orientation of the police... Nigerian policemen are trained to be brutal. Let's continue with you, Segalink, while we try to reconnect back with me. With, with, you know, um, Segalink, let's bring, you, let's bring you up now. Now, he did say yeah. that the Nigerian police are trained to be brutal, uh, are trained to be defective. Yeah. Do, do you want to re re react to that, please? Yes, we're saying the same thing. I'm saying that the, the, the police acts that we have now that guides the training of the police and the rest you know, is based on the culture of impunity, meaning that it, as at 1963, uh, of uh, 43, when this act was promulgated, there was no provision for human rights as at that time. And even when human rights came to being, it wasn't factored in any training. Can you hear me? Please? Yes, please, go ahead. Okay, so, so yeah. it, it wasn't yeah. factored in. So I agree with him in that, in, that, in that right. But I must also say that when you talk about over-centralization, you cannot... You cannot decentralize in that regard the police system without a true federation in the country. Unless Nigeria is truly, uh, power is devolved to the state or to the regions, you cannot have a decentralized police. 
Because the entire criminal justice system, as we have it today, is defective itself. You see uh, the way the prisons are operating as a mere warehouse within the criminal justice system without thinking of factoring in uh, 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 corrections. We also have the judiciary running their own uh, scheme within. It's just because people don't wait to get to that level. But, uh, uh, that's why we're not getting enough complaints from the judicial aspect, from the magistrate and the rest. So it stopped, the box stopped at the policeman because this is where people try to negotiate themselves out of impunity in some cases, while in most cases they face uh, brutality, sometimes leading into death. And we've been engaging in this for many, for, for over three or four years now. And what we have seen as a recurring decimal is this level of uh, act of impunity that, you know, has not been corrected and it cannot be corrected with stop gaps. Everything we do now or we try to put in place now cannot be overturned by a new IG, which is why I'm saying with the security of tenure of an IG, it will be easier for the IG to make permanent, so bring about permanent solutions, even if he has to step on toes. Knowing fully well that he will serve his tenure yeah, a and he bit, will uh, leave. Right let, me, now, let me interject. Secondly, IGs, just hold your thoughts there. Let me, yeah. let me throw this to Shina. Now, the House of Representatives has okay. condemned extrajudicial killings and human rights abuses uh, by security operatives mm. uh, during the, the period of, of the lockdown. What would you say mm. largely contributed to these, given the fact that they were there to enforce these laws and protect the lives of yeah. people? You know, but we, we saw okay. a whole lot of human rights abuses, harassment, brutality, and in some cases, murder. Absolutely. Yeah. I think when you send someone on an errand and you don't supervise them, apart from yeah. the issues that we've discussed in terms of their training, you know, uh, training to, to be oppressive, to force rather than reason, a policeman should be respected more than feared. But the contrary is the case in Nigeria. They need to be feared, to believe, to, 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 to have a sense of... Now, yeah. the instructions that were given to them during the lockdown period was inadequate. And usually when you have training, I have some idea about how much goes to the training of the rank and file as against how much goes to training of officers. So what will usually happen is that the officers will know what should be done. But the rank and file are sent out without supervision, without instruction. And as Shego has already said, there is nothing called human rights training in the vocabulary of policemen. So how do you unleash people like that out? And I want us to extray the training process because everything goes down. You cannot take from a man what you didn't give to him. You can't demand from the police decency, the ability to be able to organize people, except such a policeman from his home training or from his background, has some of those things naturally. But what I insist is that the police are trained to be deliberately oppressive because the colonial police which we, uh, which we inherited were trained to oppress people who are, who are asking for independence. Right. They were the trained house, to no, oppress people. Me, me, they yeah. were trained for the colonialists. They were trained to serve the oppressors. The, the, house of so the, the, the House requested Buhari to direct heads of security agencies implicated in the human rights abuses and extrajudicial killings to prosecute the perpetrators for, for prosecution. But similar calls you know, have been but, made in previous situations. Yeah, you, know? yeah, you see, but most of the uh, uh, elite in power, House of Reps and all of them, they benefit from this kind of arrangement. You know, it's one thing to give instructions. Yes, they've asked Buhari to do it. Uh, whether Buhari will do it, well, it, it's, it's left for everyone to see. In the first place, do they realize, I mean, they could say it out of pressure. Social media has brought out pressure. But I'm yet to see one deliberate effort by any member of the House of Representatives or by anybody in government, because they are, all of them, they have orderlies, they have policemen who they use from time to time. A certain House of Representatives member actually, and he was caught on camera, instructing his police orderly to beat a helpless woman. So how do you expect people like that to actually drive and push you know, for these kind of changes? The Inspector General of Police himself has not addressed the issue, and people have been killed. And in any case, what is the case of, of how, how do you justify such a behavior, and then the police itself is doing its own inquiry? 
The question Nigerians should ask is, who polices the police? The police. Who polices the police? Now, Shegun, how do you suggest the government tackle this yeah. problem of, of trigger-happy security operatives? Because it seems to be a, a deeply seated, rudely problem. It is on the forces happening, and it's still going to happen again. How do they begin to tackle this issue entrenched in our security architecture? Police reform is actually an executive bill, but the executive have not been responsible as far as this is concerned. Basically, it shows that the lives of Nigerians actually don't matter to the executives from the way I see it. Because um, the police trust fund bill and the policy and police reform bill was actually facilitated by CSOs. The executive had no hand in it. They, just, they were just watching on the sidelines. Side when the bill was eventually passed and the president signed it into law, it took another year before the president now started thinking of um, appointing board members to execute that particular bill. And eventually, they put in people who have no interest of Nigeria at heart or who have no capacity to actually uh, uh, deliver on whatever what it entails. That's number one for the police trust fund bill. On the police reform bill, if at all there's anything we need to do about trigger happy police officers now, is to fast track that bill. Because within that bill lies the various uh, operational uh, fix that is required to make police work you know, accordingly. Both in training, it's a total overhaul. And if this is done, we'll be able to have the kind of peace, because if, uh, the peace that we deserve as a society. You cannot have a civilization where law and order does not uh, exist. And if we are going to say law and order, we're, picking, we're speaking about police officers. And if the police officers we have don't understand what law means, don't understand what order means, then we're in trouble. So that's precisely what we're saying, that a lot of things need to be done. And we cannot continue to let police be a judge, jury, and executioner in their own case. Their so own that course. is one of the reasons why yeah. within... In their own, so, so within the police reform bill, we have a, a, a provision that ensures that the private sector, that is the civil society organization, will be embedded, will be part and parcel of the discipline and, and the promotions of the police itself. So it's not just about them, you know, because pol uh, pro corruption and impunity within a police structure is peer-induced and peer-reinforced. They are not going to, there is a camaraderie within the system that will not make them even face justice or do anything that, uh, that, will, that will factor, that will put the people first, other than themselves. It's like a cult of some sort. As you yeah. can see now, how can we have an IG in place where these things are happening and we don't hear him condemn these things or take actions on these things? Why will he take action when he knows that it will affect his, his tenure as IG? When he knows that it will only take a sergeant, it will take a few politicians to come together and he will be sacrificed. So nobody wants to be sacrificed. They want to live through their tenure because there's no security of tenure. So politically, they will do whatever it is, or they will ignore whatever it is at the expense of the people. Which is why we're saying that when we look deep into the police reform bill, and we execute this bill, and we monitor this bill, and we evaluate this bill eventually, we'll be able to see other gaps that, are, that, uh, that lies within, and we'll be able to fix our problem. If you solve the police problem, we have solved half of Nigeria's problem. Shino, do you agree with Shekhar there? Do. If we solve the police problem, we've solved the Nigerian problem. And what Correct. would you recommend Correct. going forward? What, what are your recommendations? Can I just mention something, please? I yes. think, number one, the governors, the governors of the states don't realize their constitutional powers regarding the police uh, services. And, uh, you know, there is a, a council, the police council, the national police council that is supposed to include all governors. I think the governors, too, at times, they sit back and allow oppression in their states. So I would say the governors should be up and doing and also should take the flag. I mean, being the security officer of the state also means he should ensure that everybody in the state has some kind of access to security or protection from abuses in security. So I think the governors do have a role to play. Gentlemen, it's been a pleasure having you join us on Plus Policy tonight. Shegun Awosanya, sure. Segalink, thank you very much for your time. And also, Shino Fagmiro Brown, thank you also for your time and for your contribution. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for staying with us. We'll take our PLOS report now, and when we return, I'll be giving you my take. Stay with us. Professor Ibrahim Agbola Gambari was born on November the 24th, 1944, in Ilorin, Kwara State. He was Nigeria's Minister for External Affairs between 1984 and 1985. 
Professor Gambari attended the prestigious King's College in Lagos and subsequently the London School of Economics, where he obtained a Bachelor of Science degree in economics in 1968. He specialized in international relations and later obtained a master's degree in 1970 and PhD in political science and international relations in 1974 from the Columbia University, New York. Professor Gambari began his teaching career in 1969 at City University of New York before working at the University of Albany. He later taught at the Amadou University, Zaria, in Kaduna State. He was a visiting professor at three universities in Washington District of Columbia, the John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, Georgetown University, and the Howard University between 1986 and 1989. Professor Gambari has been a research fellow at the Brookings Institute, also in Washington, D.C., and a resident scholar at the Bellagio Study and Conference Center, the Rockefeller Foundation-run center in Italy. He was accorded a Doctor of Human Letters from the University of Bridgeport and is a member of the John Hopkins University Society of Scholars. Professor Gambari was appointed by the United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and the Chairperson of the African Union Commission as Joint African Union United Nations Special Representative for DAFO effective from January 1, 2010. He is currently the Special Advisor on the International Conflict with Iraq and Other Issues for the Secretary General of the United Nations. He was appointed as a United Nations Under Secretary General for the Department of Political Affairs on June 10, 2005, assuming the post on July 1, the same year. Professor Gambari was appointed by the Kwara State Governor, Abdul Fattah Ahmed, as the permanent chancellor of the Kwara State University on March 4, 2013. He is also a co-chair of the Albright Gambari Commission and the founder of the Savannah Center for Diplomacy, Democracy and Development. Professor Gambari has always made it known that he has been inspired by two United Nations Secretaries General, Butrus Butrus Ghali and Kofi Annan. Professor Gambari has been appointed as the Chief of Staff to President Muhammadu Buhari, a post he assumes with a wealth of experience. With the announcement of Professor Gambari by the Secretary to the Government of the Federation, Boss Mustafa, as the Chief of Staff to President Muhammadu Buhari, it brings an end to speculations on who assumes the exalted position. Amadin Uyi, Plus TV Africa. Here with my take. It is arguable that Nigeria is not ripe for independent candidates. During the First Republic, when the 1963 constitution allowed for independent candidates to contest elections, there were values and virtues in the society. Societal norms were valued and respected. There was discipline in the polity. The Westminster parliamentary system of government we had then even allowed independent candidates. Even with the large regional parties, aspirants that felt short change often opted to contest as independent candidates. However, the framers of the 1979 Federal Republic Constitution and that of 1999 refused to allow provisions for independent candidates. Allowing independent candidacy at this moment would not augur well for the growth and development of our nascent democracy. And during the First and Second Republic, we had politicians who had the interests of the nation at heart and were patriots. Whereas in the current dispensation, we have egocentric politicians who care more about their selfish interests rather than the national interests. The ongoing defections to other political parties for no justifiable reasons bear clear evidence to this assertion. So I say Nigeria is not ripe now for independent candidacy. Independent candidacy is desirable, don't get me wrong, but there are certain measures that must be taken by the Independent National Electoral Commission. 
And just recently, INEC assessed the existing 92 political parties. And currently, there are 18 political parties in the country. And with this arrangement, there is enough confusion as the electorate still find it difficult to know these political parties well. It is equally much more so where there are illiterate voters. The first thing I recommend is for the electoral body to streamline the number of political parties. When the number of political parties is streamlined, it will be easier for the electorate to know these parties and their candidates. Again, I would say the independent candidacy is desirable due to the lack or absence of internal democracy within many of the political parties in the country. It is rather unfortunate that some of the political parties do not allow the candidates to emerge through normal processes as enshrined in their constitution. And when internal democracy is not allowed to thrive, it gives room for chaos and disenchantment. According to the Council on Foreign Relations, over a thousand people were killed by security agents in the country over the past year. The Nigerian Human Rights Commission, the NHRC, a government agency said it had found eight separate incidents of extrajudicial killings leading to 18 deaths. In total, the group said it received more than 100 complaints across 24 of Nigeria's 36 states, including Lagos, Ogun, and Abuja. And in my contemplation, I asked why. Why are the people with the responsibility to keep us safe killing us? And even in the era of pandemic, which has taken the life of almost 300,000 globally, there are still ending innocent lives. I believe this problem is entrenched in the foundation of our security architecture. I believe these individuals who have our lives in their hands are trained with the mindset of having power rather than seven Nigerian citizens. I ask that the whole system be overhauled and restructured as soon as possible. I also ask that the officers be mentally evaluated so they carry out their duties with a clear mind. With the amount of fear and uncertainty that beclouds these times, we the Nigerian citizens do not need to also fear those who have the primary goal of protecting us. We deserve better. And that's our show for tonight. Thank you for staying with us. Plus, politics returns tomorrow, same time. In the meantime, be safe and be well.